If I had just done an activist film in the sense that it was just one side talking, then it would have been a little easier to dismiss because it's like that's them talking. But because it's a dialogue, because both sides are in the film, neither side can ignore it. So people who are pro-circumcision are not going to be able to ignore the film because they're in the film and the best of them are in the film. Brian Morris is in the film, Edgar Schoen is in the film, um, the authors of the HIV studies are in the film, um, and now there's a current member of the American Academy of Pediatrics Task Force, so the most recent policy statement in the film. So if people are going to debate this issue, they have to see the film because the best of that side is in the film. And likewise, the best of the intactivist side is in the film. Marilyn Milos is in the film, Georgianne Chapin, uh, Doctors Opposing Circumcision, the historical San Francisco ballot initiative, there's footage from the court protests there. There's Jonathan Conte's personal story and interviews with him that obviously, unfortunately, can't be repeated. Uh, so, and, and the film is very much the story of the intactivist movement. Like, in the opening, Marilyn talks about how she became aware of this issue, how that led to the founding of No Cirque. And intactivism is the main character in the film, and circumcision is the antagonist in the film. And that's sort of the through line that allows me to weave all these different stories together, because it's in some sense, these two characters reacting to each other and playing off of each other. I think that when most people think about circumcision, they think of it as a medical issue, as this decision that you make one time and then it's done and then you never think about it again. And the frame that I am taking with the film and the thing that interests me about it is not just this one drop of a decision, but the ripples that come out of it. So. That decision's made once when someone is born, and then that decision ripples out into the rest of their life, into their self-image, in the way that they view their body, into their sexuality, into their relationships, into their, the, the way that they experience their you know, sexuality in their own body. It ripples out into their culture, into their family relations, into medicine, institutions, religion, their tribe, there's all these huge identity level issues that it affects. And so circumcision is a medical issue in some sense, in the very small sense, but it's really a human issue. And so when I'm looking at this subject, I'm not just looking at the technical stuff, although I am absolutely looking at that and looking at it deeper than any other film has before, I'm also looking at the human element because as one of my interview subjects said, people are not just skin. And if you change someone's body in any way, they're going to have feelings about it. And those feelings are going to differ person to person, but that's the part that's interesting to me as a filmmaker is the human emotion and the experience that each person is having. When I interview someone, the first thing I do is I try to read everything that they've written and get a sense of what it is they believe and what the message they're trying to put out into the world is. And a lot of the interviews I found for the film were because I was obsessively researching this topic and I just called up every author who I'd read. And in, you know, in the process of doing that, occasionally they'd say, oh yes, and you know, while you're here, you should also talk to this person who I hadn't heard of. Um, so I read everything that, they, I, that I possibly can by them. And then when I sit down to interview, the question I usually start with is, so how did you become interested in this issue? Because no one becomes interested in the circumcision debate on purpose. It's not one of those topics that's in the mainstream, or at least not at the start of this process. Um, it's not a topic that people will take on just sort of as, a, oh, I'm looking for a cause to devote myself to. What about this thing? Like usually it finds them in some way. And the story of how they got there is often revealing because it tells what their interest is and what motivates them. So I usually start there and then I'll ask a few questions that set up what I know their main talking points are, the things that they really want to talk about. Um, the things that I've seen in their books is like a major idea or point or thing that they, you know, is important to them. Um, and then I'll ask the questions that I was really interested in. So maybe I read something and there was something that stood out to me that wasn't a major point, but I just, 
I'm talking to this person, I'm in the position where I can, I want to ask the thing that was really interesting to me. And then I'll also ask the questions that I think their critics would ask. So, you know, you've said this, but a lot of people or certain people have said they disagree with you because of this, like how do you respond to them? And part of the reason I do that is that I know that in editing, I'm also talking to people on other sides of the debate and I can put them side by side and create dialogue that didn't exist before. So they might say this and then their critics might say this and then in editing, I go back to them and say, they say oh, well, they, they may say that, but this. And there's not a lot of dialogue going on around this issue in the real world. People are sort of talking past each other they're talking to their particular group, and they're not aware of the full picture, at least not in a way that I have, having gone to each subject on both sides and interviewed them. And so through film, through editing, I can create dialogue and conversation that isn't happening in the real world. My family's reaction to this issue has evolved over time. Um, I think when I first told my mom about it, she said, I don't know that anyone would want to watch a film about that. And there was a little bit of like, why? Like, they just didn't understand. And then as I, like, in the first month of working on the film, my dad called me and apologized for making that decision for me. Which was I, unexpected, like, unasked for. I, you know, I think I'd sent him when I first started one email that was like, kind of mean, um, and then I haven't really talked about it since then. And he just basically, you know, called me and said, well, you're making a film on this. Um, I'm guessing if you're doing that, you, you aren't happy about something about it. And, um, you know, we made the decision we thought you would have wanted, and if it's not the decision you would have wanted, I'm sorry. And um, that really did a lot for our relationship. And that's part of the reason I think that we are still as close as we are. Um, so when I went back to Virginia a little while ago, my dad and I started writing together. We've done, we've got one screenplay we've done together and we're working on another. Um, and we talk really frequently and he's given me advice on like, you know, the, how to help do the financial stuff for the film and how to market it. And it's been really helpful. Um, my mom's a little different. I think she initially, she's one of those people like she doesn't like to admit when she's wrong. And so she initially, I think, was a little more, a little more defensive. And, but she's also one of those people that when she comes around, like she never, she never disagreed. So once she got it, um, like she always got, that's just, she now, you know, she knows now. Um, and I think that part for her, she started studying herbalism and she started learning about how, how much of medicine is based on the industry rather than based on healing. And so for her, like she is very, very surprising transformation. Actually, she went from, um, being a very sort of technically oriented person to like, going into this like, oh, the earth will provide, you know, I never would have guessed that my mom would have gone that direction, but it was actually really cool to see. And she has a huge passion around it. She's really good at it and um, sends me little herbal things that she's made every now and then, which are actually really useful. I, I still use the muscle salve that she sent me for, you know, after soreness after the gym. Um, so she sort of went through that. And I think that was the, the persuasion, if you will, for her to understand the other things that maybe the medical community has suggested that they didn't give as much information as they could have on. Um, and to talk to her, she, you know, she said, this is, I was born back in the eighties and, um, you know, they asked the doctor and the doctor basically told them they were idiots if they didn't do it. And like, everybody does this. How could you not? Um, didn't have the internet. They, they sort of went with the best information they had. Um, and if you think, you know, at that time too, every, everyone had had this done. Um, they, they were, I think they were biblical scholars at one point. They went through um, seminary together, theologi theological school. Um, I may be getting the details of that wrong, but I know they went and studied that together. 
And so that just seemed like that was sort of their culture, if you will. Um, and now they have actually seen my three hour edit of the film. They've watched the way too long version that I'm working on editing down. Um, really liked it. They agreed with me that it could be shorter and they gave me some advice. Here's some spots you could, you know, bring it down. And, um, you know, we're really, really impressed with it, really moved by it. And my mom told me, she said, I think this film could change a lot. Um, yeah. So it's, it's been very exciting to see that change. And my dad told me too, he said, you know, this is going to be a heavy film for some people. Like they said, we've had five years of you making this film to like get pieces of information and like, oh, that's not normal. And that's something that's a result of this. And, um, some people are going to get it all in two hours, just one, <laughs> one giant uh, blast of the film, if you will. Uh, so I don't know how people are going to react to that. I think it's going to be a very intense experience for some people. But, you know, again, for them, I think one of the things that, that worked for us is that my parents are people who are open to changing when they receive new information. And... Uh, there's tons of books in our house. They're always interested in learning. They're always learning new things themselves. And those skills, those ways of seeing the world have rubbed off on me. I think that my capacity for self-development is very much influenced by my parents and how much they taught me to learn and how much they enjoy learning themselves. So the fact that they were open to new information and that they were willing to be in dialogue with me about this and, and admit when they're wrong. So there are times where my parents will, like, like my dad did, will apologize, like, oh, we thought this, and then now we know this. And, um, and thankfully, they also taught me forgiveness. So we're, we're still good. What really bothered me when I discovered this subject was the feeling of powerlessness that it gave me because there was this thing that had been done to my body that I couldn't change. And I was going through a phase where I was changing everything in my life. And I was very interested in self-development. I was very interested in personal growth. And a lot of that process was letting go of patterns I'd been given as a child that didn't serve me anymore. And so the fact that there was something about my body that I couldn't change about my reality that really bothered me because I'm someone who wants to feel in control and powerful in my own life and not being able to do that in a particular area, like it stuck with me. And initially my reaction to that was to go, well, if there's nothing I can do about it, why think about it? And I think that's the reaction a lot of people have. And so I just, you know, out of sight, out of mind, like if you can't change it, why think about it? Um, and then I started doing meditation and in meditation, you don't get to decide what you think about and what you don't. So it started coming up during meditation, like the thought circumcision would enter my mind. And again, that really bothered me because it's kind of an uncomfortable subject. But I pay attention to what comes to me in meditation. And so when that happened, I said, all right, I'll investigate this. I'll research it. And then that's the research that eventually led to the film. I think this film has taught me that people are not rational and that most people do not make their decisions rationally. My sort of theory of persuasion, actually, even the fact that I have a theory of persuasion has come through this film because my, my initial intention when, when starting it was I was learning all this stuff and I thought, well, I just got to share this information with other people and then they'll get it and that'll be it. You know, there's all this information that I'm aware of that other people aren't aware of and we just got to make them aware of it. And then what I found as I did the film and as I talked to people about this is that sometimes you'd share the information with people and they wouldn't get it. And not only would they not get it, they would not want to hear what you're saying and they would shut it down. Like there is this, don't talk about that. Um, and a really like aggressive, defensive, angry response for even from people I'd known a long time and who I would have thought of 
as gentle or caring in other situations. And it really bothered me. Um, so I was like, what's that about? Like, what is going on here? And that is what led me to become curious about the, the character study aspects of this. Because there's this thing and there's this information and that's fascinating. But then there's the reactions everyone has to it, which is bizarre and weird. Uh, and it's made me really think about why people believe what they believe and why people believe irrational things. And, and my sort of theory of persuasion is that people don't make decisions rationally. They make them tribally. And that the need to belong is stronger than the need to actually see reality as it is. So when, I think when people are trying to make their minds up on something, they don't actually look at the information. They look at the social tribes involved and they ask, what tribe do I want to be a part of most? And they just join that tribe and they shift their beliefs to the beliefs of the tribe. Okay, so the issue of circumcision is the most identity level issue you can get because it's your family, your parents, your culture, your tribe, your body, your cock. Like, it doesn't get more identity level than that. And so when people hear about this issue, they go, well, I'm this. And they immediately jump to an identity. I'm circumcised, or my family's circumcised, and that's my tribe, and you must be insulting my tribe and you have these weird reactions where you say, well, I'm doing a documentary on this subject. And people go, I'm fine with my penis. And you're like, what? No one is asking about your penis, dude. Like, stop. Like, I don't care. That's not. So, like, where does that come from? It's a tribal defense. It's, it's that people have framed circumcision as I am circumcised rather than circumcision is something that happened to me. And they've turned it into an identity. And they've done it without realizing it's an identity. And without realizing that, you know, maybe, maybe their values align with tribe. People should make their own decisions about their bodies more. But th they've almost picked a tribal identity unconsciously without ever actually, without even knowing it is an identity. And I think that the challenge for any activists on this issue is to offer a better identity than the one that people have and to look like a tribe that people want to join. One of the things that I've learned over time is to keep my filmmaking really simple. So I think when I started back in high school and film school, I was all about different techniques and like, oh, if I do this with the camera and I'll get really fancy and now I just, I figure out what my story beats are, and I have a shot where I tell that story beat, and I have a shot where I tell the next story beat, and that's it. Like, most of the film is sit down interviews like this. Um, it's footage from protests. There's gonna be some graphics put in the final version and things like that. But it's very simple, and I think it has to be very simple with a subject matter this complex. Because there's a lot for the audience to get, and a lot of information to give very quickly, and in order to tell that, you have to keep it simple enough that everyone can follow. The filmmaking process is very straightforward. As far as putting an interview subject at ease, a lot of that happens in the pre-work of just sort of figuring out who they are and also being open to change that when I actually meet them. Um, so sometimes I meet someone and they're different and that's interesting and that's great and I love being surprised. When I was calling up interview subjects, there was one guy who was a moil and a urologist. I thought like, great, we get both of those perspectives in the film. Uh, he was local to where I was living. It would be, just be like a drive across town. And I called him up. I said, I'm doing a film in circumcision. You know, can I interview you? And he said, well, you're going to interview those intactivists because if you're interviewing them, I don't want to be in the film. And I don't want to be in it unless I can have final edit over everything that I'm in. And I was like, well, we are interviewing them because we're doing, like, you have to show both sides. This is a documentary. And I'm not going to give you executive producer privileges just so you can talk on camera. Like, that's ridiculous. Um, but I was really worried after that because, like, just the idea that I would interview intactivists was enough for him to say no. Um, and I want to be honest with my interview subjects. And so I was trying to figure out how to do that and also get both sides. Because I was worried I would call people up 
And they would just say no because I was actually trying to show both sides. And so I had a book on documentary. I think it was like the only book that I had at the time on it. And it had a section on ethics. So I was like, great, I'm going to look this up and then I'm just going to do what it says and it will be, we'll be good. And so that section, had, when I opened it up, had a, it said documentary ethics should follow the process of informed consent. And then it gave the medical definition of informed consent. And now if you're familiar with informed consent on this issue, that's completely confusing because the informed consent for circumcision is, would you like a circumcision? And there's almost no information given. It's asked right before um, they're about to take the baby away. The parents are sometimes still under, you know, the mom's still under the effect of pregnancy drugs. They're in this like shock state of like, oh my God, I'm a parent now. Like, what does that mean? Um, so there's virtually no informed consent done for circumcision. And so I was trying to figure out like, how do I handle that? And so I thought, well, I'll just do, I'll do the informed consent, but I'll do it the way that they do around this issue. So I would say, I'm doing a documentary on circumcision. Do you want to be in it? That's it. And that actually ended up working out really well because most people involved on this issue want to talk about it if they're involved in it. And the people who don't want to talk about it aren't that involved on it. So there are a lot of people who like, they really wanted to either debate the intactivists or share the intactivist perspective. And they were just sort of totally on board. Um, there were a few I sort of gave a little bit about my own perspective on and they were still willing to. And I knew I could do that because like we talked about earlier, I was aware of what their motivations were and that they were open to dialogue. And so that worked out. But that was just sort of the, the, the informed consent process actually informed the ethics of the documentary. And I actually, I probably had a greater informed consent process than it's usually given for circumcision. I've seen a lot of activists use pictures of the circumcision and it's very shocking and it's very graphic. And I think when you just show someone that you're like, look at this horrible thing, people are like, oh, they don't like it, they're disgusted, but they shut down, they don't wanna see that. Um, so this trailer starts with a cute baby. And I've actually heard people in the movement talk about how when they approach people with images of cute babies as a pro-intact movement as opposed to an anti-circumcision movement, they get better, better reception. So this trailer starts with this cute baby and then it starts going somewhere else. So you're like, okay, you're in a hospital and the child's being taken somewhere. And then there's this tray set up and these tools what's the, oh and they're tying the baby down and so it progresses and rather than just being a horrible thing happening i think people only will care about that if there's a character they care about in the midst of it so first there's this character that you care about this baby you like them a likable character who then is about to go through adversity of some kind and you know, people had left comments, they said that they were moved to tears, that there was this really emotional reaction. And I think that happened because they really cared about the baby first. And that, I mean, that's what storytelling is, is there's a character you care about and then something happens to them. So I think for activists, they would do well to focus on the moment before. Like there's this shocking thing that you wanna change, but first focus on who it's happening to and the character and building that relationship with the audience of like, this is someone we care about. Now let me tell you what they're gonna go through. I've had a vision from the very beginning of this process of what the film would be. And it's really good to see parts of that vision fill in, including things I've had since the beginning. Like since the beginning of this process, I have wanted to open the film with a circumcision in some way, just to show people what that actually is, because I think people have a mental image and then there's the real thing, which looks very different. Um, and I have been trying to figure out how to do that. And now it does have that opening, that teaser trailer that you may have seen is the opening of the film in the current edit. 
And so there's all these things that I've been thinking about for years that are now coming together. And there's still a whole lot of things that I'm, you know, that we're going to do. But um, it's really crazy to have had a vision that long. And like now you're like, I'm starting to see people react to it. And it's like I, five years ago, I thought they would react that way. And they did. And even sometimes stronger than I thought that they would. We interviewed Brian Morris for three hours. Um, much of that's probably going to be in the special features because I think people are going to be really interested in seeing that. Uh, the way that I ended up interviewing Brian Morris was, you know, I mentioned earlier doing the work. Like I was doing that Meisner acting class and I did an emotional prep around like what if I was to interview this person and it had a really intense like that would be huge for the film. And so I emailed him afterward. Because I was like, well, I should follow through on that. And I said, you know, we really want to interview for this film. We interviewed Edgar Schoen. And he said that you're also like a huge expert. Um, but you're all the way in Australia. And that'd be really expensive to go there. So is there any chance, any time you're going to be in the United States? And can we interview you there? You know, we'll travel. We'll meet you somewhere in the United States. And he said, I'm going to be at a conference in Hawaii in two weeks. So it's like, all right, we got to be in Hawaii in two weeks. Uh, and it was like a $300 plane ticket. It was $1,400 if you were flying to Australia. So way cheaper. But at the time, I was not really sure, like, how am I going to afford that? And I needed to get two tickets because I was going to take a friend of mine with me to run camera so that I could just focus on the interview and not have to worry. You know, he would cover the technical stuff. Um, so it was like, okay, like... We just, we just got to get these tickets. And I think I waited a little bit. It ended up being like 400 you know, by the time I bought them. Um, so we get to the airport, and the flight's overbooked. And they're going to have to put us on a flight the next day. And I was like, we can't, like, we are interviewing at 2 o'clock tomorrow. We cannot go on the later flight. I was very adamant with them. And they said, all right, well, we can get you on a flight that will get you there at noon. I was like, noon. Like, we're going to have to go straight from the airport to the interview. Um, and I was like, uh, I don't know, like that is not going to work great for us. And I said, well, we'll give you, we'll give you a, a four hundred dollar voucher, and we'll put you up in a hotel. And I was like, well, we live here, like we need a new hotel. Well, you know, what does that do for me? And my sometime was like, oh no, we should get the hotel. I think he was going to do something to that hotel. Uh, I was like, we don't need the hotel. And so the guy said, what if I gave you a six hundred dollar voucher and no hotel? And I paid two hundred less than that for the tickets. So we were going to make money on the trip. And I was like, all right, well, for that, I'll do it. So we went back. We got like two hours of sleep and then immediately went back to the airport to get on our flight. And uh, the plane landed at noon. The plane, like, we deboarded the plane at 1230. We got our bags at 1. They made us check our bags. We brought our camera bags and carry-ons so we could just rock around and go there. They made us check them because they were, you know, not enough space. Uh, and then we were in a taxi heading to the hotel where this conference was happening that he was at at 1.30 and literally walked in the building at 2. And as we were walking in the building, he walks out of an event and was like, oh, perfect timing. Um, and I was like, yeah, like, we're so glad to see you. We're going to go set up. And uh, I literally just ran through the hotel, found a room that no one was in and that had decent lighting and was like, all right, we're going to shoot here. And occasionally, you know, and points to an interview, like a, a staff, like one or two, like a staff person came in and like, oh, someone's using this room and left. Like we just like stole a room. We're like, we're going to film here. It's going to be great. And then we interviewed him for like three hours. And it was really interesting. Um, I don't know how much of that I want to reveal now before the film is out. But I think that people, I think for some people that's going to be their favorite part of the film including some intactivists uh, because the interesting thing about this issue is dialogue and sometimes listening to someone you disagree with can be very revealing and I think Brian Morris shows a lot about who he is in the film and everyone who has seen the film has had a very strong reaction to him 
uh, the, it's interesting. Everyone who's seen the film, they had a very particular reaction to Brian Morris, and they had a very particular reaction to Marilyn Milos. And those two characters are sort of the main characters of the film. Uh, Brian Morris, Edgar Schoen, Marilyn Milos, and George N. Chapin. And we, you know, we show that in the the marketing so far of the film. Like, and those those are the four biggest voices on this issue. Um, but like I said, it's it's a character study as much as information. So all of them present their information, but they also show a lot about who they are. And I'll leave it at that because you're gonna have to see the film if you want to know the rest. I had this sort of moment of like, what am I doing? Like, there's so much else I could have been doing with this time. And like, is anyone going to want to watch this? Um, and I, I had this moment where I realized I probably look like a crazy person to most. Like, you know, I'm spending hundreds of hours shooting all this stuff. And I've got a stack of footage and nothing. And like, what, you know, like, what does this look like? And, um, but I had this vision of what I wanted and what the film was going to look like and where it was going and why it mattered. And it's funny during that time, I, you know, I, was, I actually did some like therapy stuff and I, the person I was working with actually cared about this issue. And they said, you know, like it matters to me, like I want to see this film. And that was enough. That was all I needed to hear to like, okay, like someone's going to care. Um, which is why it's been really good, you know, putting out the teaser trailer and the marketing and like starting to get that validation of like, all right, like people want to see this, like it is going to matter. Like, um, cause I've had to self generate that from within. And I, I think that that's a really useful skill. Um, but you know, doing it for like a couple of years straight, is pretty intense. And I don't know, I actually don't know if there's anyone else who could have done that. I think there's some things about my own personal disposition that like may be uniquely suited for that. Um, but I heard a statement by someone later that really like summed that up to me and made sense to me, which was that success looks like failure until you succeed. Meaning that mid process, it just, it doesn't look like you've done anything. Um, I've heard Meryl Streep too say that, that the acting process looks like bad art. Like until you have that final version, it's just not good. Uh, and if you show it to anyone, they're like, what is that? Like, it's not good. It's not there yet. And I've had the perseverance to be, to have this know that, okay, I have this vision and it will reach that vision and I will keep working on it until it becomes that vision. I've heard it said too, you know, people always say like, if you want to succeed, you need passion, like passion and passion fades, you know, that's, there's lots of people who have passion who never make it. Obsession is there outside your window still stalking you after passion has left. I actually think that obsession is way better than passion. And, and it also, that is why you look a bit like a crazy person until you get there because it's just this thing and you're working on it. And, um, so I guess, I don't know where I was going with that, except to say uh, thank you for those of you who've cared and who have watched the film or watched the trailers and who are interested in supporting this, um, for, who are willing to join me in my particular brand of crazy. Um, it's very helpful. It's very helpful to have, you know, just even talking to, so talking to you, James, like we have, we have talked on Skype as I've been working on the process. I've shown you small clips of the film in progress and gotten feedback on them. And that's been really helpful because it's allowed to me get to get a little bit of that feedback and that feeling of like it is coming together and that validation without putting it out to the, in the world in a state that isn't finished yet. Because I know that if I was to show the current edit to people, they'd say, this is really good, but it's too long. And it's like, yes, it's three hours. It needs to be shorter. I know this. Um, in the final version, I'm, I'm, it takes a lot of discipline to delay gratification and to wait until it's in the state that you can show it to people. And I actually think that that vision is what gives you that discipline because I know what I want it to look like and I know what it could look like and I know what it could feel like. 
and it's not there yet, and I'm going to keep working until it's there. 